I got my TurboGrafx-16 not long after its debut in North America. I had been curious about this newcomer for a while, partially because I had read quite a bit about its Japanese variant, the PC Engine, but also because it was gaming software from someone other than Sega or Nintendo. Many of the games you'll see in this top 10 were special not only because they were great games, but at the time, you couldn't play them on any other console. TurboGrafx-16 games had a certain look and feel all their own that distinguished them from Genesis and Super Nintendo games quite a bit, and that's one of the reasons I loved it. Just hearing the music play of a multi-platform game could clue me in to which version was playing without even looking at the screen. The list you are about to see are 10 games on the system I enjoyed most. I'm not trying to be objective here. My top 10s are very personal and very much my own. I share them to see how they stack up against yours and where we agree and disagree. Feel free to share your own in the comments. I hope you guys enjoy my top 10 TurboGrafx-16 games. Most people wouldn't put this on their list, but it's damn sure on mine. I received Bonk's Adventure shortly after I got my Turbo and loved every minute of it. It had been heavily advertised on TV and in magazines, a mascot character to rival the likes of Mario himself. I loved it from the get-go too. The colorful graphics and huge characters had instant appeal, and the music was like nothing I had heard on my Genesis. The gameplay was different too, using mechanics that involved beating enemies to a pulp with your head. It was a simple game to get into as well. There was no real story to get in the way of the action and you knew exactly what you were doing just looking at what was going on on the screen. Later games in the series would add more stuff to do, better visuals, and even switch up the genre. But it's this one I had the most fun with. It came along early in the system's life and gave me a unique looking and sounding game I couldn't play anywhere else. My little sisters understood it too, and we would sit for hours passing the controller around. I had been a fan of shoot 'em ups for quite some time, so when Cotton showed up for the TurboGrafx CD in 1993, I was all over it. Cute 'em ups had been around for years by this point, but Cotton still managed a charm and appeal thanks to its cartoonish visuals and quality art design. Most shooters back then were forever stuck in outer space or on some alien planet, yet Cotton looked like it took place in some fantasy dream world. It would be remiss of me to talk about this one without bringing up its absolutely unforgettable music. It's the kind of stuff that gets stuck in your head and you're still humming it days later. A great soundtrack is an integral piece of a shoot 'em up experience, and this game's appeal is very much tied to that thinking. Later additions to the series would bring even better graphics and sound, but this one started it all for me. A reboot has been announced for modern systems like the Switch and PS4. I grew up with a father that was a mean drunk. The few good memories I have of my childhood with him mostly involve us doing things together of similar interest. We discovered Galaga 90 in the bargain bin and decided to give it a shot. My dad loved Golden Age arcade games so it was right up his alley and I took to it as well. The great variety, single screen and scrolling stages and that classic Galaga appeal had us both trying to beat one another's high score. It didn't matter that it was only one player, just having something that we both wanted to do was a rare enough thing. For months we went back and forth, battling the high score scribbled on the notepad beside the TV. Times like those were few and far between, but this game gave me a small reprieve from the status quo of ignoring one another. <laughs> Oh, my God. 
Getting CD technology in a console in the early 90s was something special. All of a sudden you got CD quality sound, animated cinemas, and all kinds of speech and cool sound effects. One of the first games I would own on this tech was the incredible East Book 1 and 2. This is a compilation of remakes for the first two East games, heavily enhanced by a new CD soundtrack, tons of voice acting, and impressive cinemas. As good as these were before, they are so much better here. The gameplay is a bit different from what you'll see in most RPGs. You still explore around and buy items and talk to people, but when it comes to battle, it's all automatic and in real time. Running into enemies constitutes an attack, with stronger enemies requiring you to be leveled up to deal with them. Standing still for a few seconds replenishes your life, and back to the battles you go. I can't stress enough how impressive this game was for a 1990 release. You had not seen or heard anything like this at the time, and it was the poster child for CD technology in games for years. This is how you made a cartridge game better, and it was one hell of a ride. Most of you remember Double Dragon 2 for its great arcade and home ports. Well, in 1993, Naxet took the general premise of that game and made it their own. They changed a lot too. Stage design, the visual style, the music, and loads of other touches make this one quite the different experience. But you know what? That's why it appealed to me. It was different and you didn't often get that in games that were normally quick port jobs. The thing is, is while it does have its differences, it's still a really fun game that captures the fun of two-player beat-em-ups properly. The enemy AI is better than other home versions as well, and it can be challenging to those expecting to just walk over the game without a fight. Animated cinemas have been added too, you know, because of the CD and all. If you haven't played this one yet, definitely give it a go. Expecting something different will help you enjoy it a whole lot more. One of the TurboGrafx-16's earliest releases, The Legendary Axe, also happens to be one of the most impressive. Every facet of this presentation is unique. From the incredibly detailed backdrops, the music, the attack methods, and even the enemies, you will not find a game like this on any other platform. Just look at the color in those backgrounds. I mean, it doesn't even matter there's no parallax scrolling because it all still looks so good. Each area is expertly crafted and painstakingly detailed for such an early game in the system's life. And that music, just listen to it. There's no other game that even remotely sounds like it. You won't have a lot of time to chill back and enjoy it all though, because the Legendary Axe is one hell of a hard game. Enemy patterns are aggressive and well placed to rob you of your hit points. Holes are everywhere for you to fall into, and boss battles will show you no mercy no matter how well prepared you are. The gameplay is based on timing your attacks. Attack quickly and in rapid fire succession and you do little damage. Time each hit with a full power gauge at the top of the screen and you'll crush your foes under your might. This is a turbo classic that never gets old. You typically will not see me put games like Street Fighter 2 in a top 10 list for 16-bit systems. I mean, while they were fun, they were not quite on the same level as the arcade. I have to put the PC Engine port on here, however. Not only does the system do the source proud, but this is coming from tech that was originally released in 1987. Grab yourself a six-button pad and there is very little reason to complain about this game. It sounds as it should, the voice work is solid, and the detail in the visuals rival both the Genesis and Super Nintendo ports. 
Perhaps even more impressive was the fact all this was done in a 20 megabit hue card that was roughly the size of your driver's license. The PC Engine surprised me numerous times in its life, and this here was definitely one of them. Getting my Turbo Duo had been a heck of an experience in and of itself, but finding a game the quality of Gate of Thunder for free in the box was something else entirely. Backed by a kick-ass soundtrack and gorgeous visuals, you get point blank one of the best shoot-em-ups on the platform. Hell, any platform for that matter. Just look at these clips and tell me that doesn't look incredible. And here, just listen to that music. Absolutely the stuff of legends. It isn't a particularly long game, but it burns so bright that every second of it is a memorable experience. There's no filler here. Stage design is perfect, the weapon system is easy to understand, and every boss encounter epic. At the time, this was the blueprint for great horizontal shoot-em-ups in my opinion. It had a standalone release in Japan for the PC Engine Super CD, but the only way to get it in North America was as a Turbo Duo pack-in. The Castlevania series often made itself well known on every platform it was released for. Dracula X was a bit of an exception because it was only released in Japan for years as a PC Engine Super CD title. Konami set out to do something special here, and man did they succeed in then some. You get multiple paths to take, secret characters to find, killer cinemas, a soundtrack from the gods, and finally a visual feast for your eyes. Wrap it up in your typically excellent Castlevania gameplay, and you have yourself a contender for best game of the generation. I really was impressed from the moment I pressed the run button in this one. Great animation and set pieces really give the game an otherworldly presentation that is elevated so far above the stuff you typically saw on the platform, you can't help but be impressed. The bestiary here was so well done it would go on to be used for years after in many other Castlevania games. Symphony of the Night would go on to be a direct sequel to this, and includes many of the same characters and enemies. If you enjoyed the old school Castlevania action titles, this one is a must play. My number one game has more to do with just the quality of its graphics, sound, and gameplay. Splatterhouse was top notch in all of these things, of course but it was the atmosphere and setting that elevated this arcade port to stellar heights. At a time when video games were never scary, Splatterhouse gave you the first real attempt at a horror game. Namco gave you a main character you immediately associated with the horror icon Jason Voorhees, then stuck you in a story about trying to save your girlfriend from demons and monsters. And not just any monsters, but gross, puke-spitting monsters that burst open and splattered all over the place when killed. It also didn't have the happy ending most games at the time had. There was no princess to bake you a cake, or happy music playing while you looked off into the sunset. In fact, the best you could do was survive your ordeal with your soul intact. And that's what made Splatterhouse so special. As many of us transitioned from young children to teenagers, this was one of the first games to treat you to more serious, more mature content. It was one of the first video games I ever played that broke down the wall of lies built by a plumber jumping on the heads of turtles, and made me realize that no matter how hard you tried, sometimes you won't get the ending you think you deserve.
Looking at my original list of games I considered for this episode, there are a good 20 more titles that easily could have made it into this video. The very Zelda-like Newtopia was an adventure worth taking, and there are great shooters like Blazing Lasers and Lords of Thunder to consider. The point being is, is that between the US and Japanese markets, this platform was far more special than its meager sales numbers would have you believe. While the Super Nintendo and Genesis outsold it worldwide by huge amounts, this system has a stellar library that has something for everyone. While shoot'em ups offered tons of choices, other genres were well represented. Most of you were owners of other hardware during the late 80s and early 90s, but don't sleep on this one. Whether it's emulation, the real thing, or the new classic console that's out there, you need to give this machine a fair shake. Even if you continue to feel that the Genesis or Super Nintendo are better machines, I'm positive you'll come away respecting the Turbo a whole lot more. I'm Sega Lord X, thank you guys for watching, and I will catch you next time.